Over the last 2,000 years, these islands have seen wave after wave of immigrants. Romans, Anglo-Saxons, Vikings, Normans. They came, they saw, and they did their best to conquer. To assert control over the ancient Britons, some marked their territorial boundaries with massive fortifications, like Hadrian's Wall or Offa's Dyke, a concept given renewed currency by more recent global events. However, a growing body of evidence gathered at Britain's historic boundary walls suggests that their story may not be quite as simple as we once thought. In the past, we often saw these dividing walls as places of inevitable violence or of intractable separation. But recent evidence is reshaping this view, offering a fresh insight into Britain's ancient inhabitants. The old image of barbarian warriors, wiped from history by vanquishing invaders, is giving way to a new picture of the people known as the Celts. These huge stones forming a circular monument have stood here in the northwest of England for at least 3,000 years. But who placed them here and why remains an enigma. The people living in these islands at that time are often known as the Celts, but actually we know remarkably little about them. The ancient Britons left us nothing in the form of written records, which is probably why we've tended to accept the story told by the invaders, that they were a barbaric bunch of savage warriors. One thing we can say about Britain's native inhabitants is that they were a hugely diverse mix of people, cultures and identities, often lumped together under a single, rather inaccurate name. Until the 1700s, no one referred to the inhabitants of these islands as Celts. It was only when 18th century scholars discovered that the languages spoken by these peoples bore some similarities to the languages spoken by the Celtic peoples of Europe that the same name began to be applied to the ancient Britons. And ever since then, the word Celts has stuck. For thousands of years, this disparate collection of tribal societies went about their business, trading, fighting, ebbing and flowing. Then, around 50 BC, a very different people landed on these shores. Enter the Romans. The first Roman sandals touched British soil as part of an unsuccessful invasion attempted by arguably the most famous Roman of all. When Julius Caesar first set foot on the land that the Romans called Britannia, he wrote this description of the people who lived there. Most do not sow corn, but live on milk and flesh and clothe themselves in skins. All the Britons, indeed, dye themselves with woad, which produces a blue colour and makes their appearance in battle more terrible. But this wasn't entirely accurate. So we know that the Britons at this time were skilled farmers and they wore garments, not furs. But it does provide a snapshot of the Roman mindset towards their newly acquired enemies. Less than a century later, the Romans returned and, over time, successfully pushed north. They dominated much of modern England, Wales and southern Scotland, but stopped short of the highlands beyond. Then, the Romans drew upon their skills, not just as military tacticians, but as civil engineers. Stretching more than 70 miles from coast to coast, Hadrian's Wall is ancient Britain's most visible border. 
Emperor Hadrian's biographer claimed that it was built to separate the Romans from the barbarians. But as a historian who searches for traces of ancient cultures in the landscapes they inhabited, I want to challenge that idea. Looking at this rather formidable structure, it's easy to imagine it as a solid barrier that kept the primitive, marauding tribes of ancient Britain to the north at bay. But is that really how it was? Some of the evidence that's emerged suggests a very different picture, one of religious and cultural exchange and even mutual cooperation. These tantalising clues give us a precious glimpse into the lives of the mysterious ancient Britons. In the Roman settlements along the route of Hadrian's Wall, such as here at the Fort of Vindolanda, life was a remarkably mixed affair, where the line between Britain and Roman may have been surprisingly blurred. Andrew Burley is director of excavations at the site. So on our right here, we've got lots of shops and houses and the remains of old barracks. So people chatting away, gambling, drinking, doing all sorts of unsavory things going on in there. And on this side, separating us from the town, we've got the Rampart Mound. In there, you'd have a combination of ovens and bread ovens. You can imagine all the meats and the pots and things bubbling away. People standing in their doors, having a natter, also smelling the food, coming out, stirring their pots. And who would be doing it? Are we talking soldiers, locals? Who's in here? We're talking about the entire community. There would probably be a few Britons around, certainly. Women, children, grandma, slaves, and some of those slaves and some of the community would be from exotic parts of the empire. So that's all mixed into this beautiful melting pot that adds the sights, the sounds and the smells of living at Vindolanda 2,000 years ago. For an insight into the Britons living in the shadow of the Roman occupation, archaeologist Lindsay Allison Jones brought me to another Roman settlement called Housteads, just a couple of miles away. So what does a place like this, outside the walls of the fort, tell us about the local population, the Britons that were living around here? Well, I think we get a very mixed picture. It's quite difficult to see because obviously people are individuals and some people will get on with the Romans and some people will not get on with the Romans. But I think if you're living here or you're within the immediate area of here, then you have accepted the Romans are here and you're going to make the best of it. If you're living up in the hills beyond there, where you're a long way away from day-to-day -day contact with the Romans, you probably regard them as pretty suspicious. But, but then there's intermarrying going on, and then you find that um, the sons of people living out here are joining the army and moving in. So it's an intermingling of people. We're not talking about Romans in tin hats and red frocks with road-painted locals. I think we can forget that altogether. The buildings here at Housesteads are, of course, rectangular. Their straight, perpendicular walls are just what you'd expect to find in a typical Roman settlement. But back at Vindolanda, Andrew showed me a completely different style of construction at the fort, which suggests a surprising degree of cooperation between the Romans and the ancient Britons at this time. Right, now this even I know, isn't the right shape for a Roman building. What's exactly. This? this is a British home for British people, built on top of an active Roman fort, which is just weird. And it's somewhat unique, but I say it's unique. You can see the foundations of the next one. If we come through the door... Oh, yeah. Let's, let's use the door. Do we need to wipe our feet. Well, we should, really. Yeah, right. You can see another one there, another one there, another one there, another one there. Just these ovals and semicircles. Yeah. All these... There are actually, we think, about 190 of these little circular huts built in British style on top of this Roman base. So what are the Britons doing here? Where are they from? Well, as far as we know, they're fairly local to this area and they are providing labour, labour for protection, because in the Roman Empire in that time, there is no such thing as charity and you don't get anything for free. And these guys here are on the Roman side. They're safe, they're protected behind Hadrian's Wall, but they've got to work for that protection. So they're doing stuff for the Romans while they're fighting fellow Britons north of where Hadrian's Wall is. But what this rather simple looking circle then represents mm. is the complexity of these ethnic 
and cultural identities. So we have to stop thinking in terms of these big blocks. It, it's oh, not yeah. that simple. No, it's not that simple. You can't simply look north of Hadrian's Wall and say, all those people out there are enemies of Rome. You can't do that because some were certainly not enemies of Rome. They were pro-Roman. They were feed, you know, supplying livestock, food for the Roman army, and they were getting gifts and, and things in return. So these are friends and allies of Romans. Some of the ancient artefacts recovered at the Vindolanda site also support the idea that these vastly different cultures began to influence each other. So you've got natural British forms with um, beautiful native designs and being used by the Roman population and Roman garrisons. So the first one is a dragon-esque brooch. And it's it's just stunning, isn't it? Oh, Absolutely that is stunning. All those little tiny what's, tessera, would you call little it? Little bits of enamel. So they've put little sections of enamel in there. So it'll be really bright and beautiful, quite gaudy. Yes, okay. but this is lovely. something that has been made by Romans? By, well, probably by Romans and native population. Both sets of artisans would be turning their hands to these because they're popular and, you know, they're expensive and you can make a bit of cash on them. So it's a fusion uh, fashion item from our northern Britain. And even more so, this time in silver, it, again with a very native design, but found in a Roman fort ditch, is uh, this lovely little duck. Can you see it? Oh, look at that. And that's its little feet paddling underneath the that's water. That's right. Now, that open sort of latticework style is a, is a very ancient style, which can be traced right back into the Iron Age. But here we've got it being used in the second century by, uh, you know, a Romanized population. So does this suggest that from the Romans' point of view, there was a lot that to be gained from local culture, local artistic traditions? Oh, there's certainly many things they want to pinch and they want to recycle and use. They, they recognise nice things and value and they recognise style and they embrace it, yeah. This very recent find, with its distinctly Celtic design, would have been worn by Romans, possibly even when they travelled to other parts of the empire, proudly announcing where they had come from. So there are clues to suggest that these two vastly different cultures didn't always remain as separate as once thought. And perhaps further evidence could be found by looking to the gods they once worshipped. Further east along Hadrian's Wall, near Newcastle-upon-Tyne, the remains of a small Roman temple now lie in the most unlikely of surroundings. smack in the middle of a 1930s housing estate. The stone altars bear the name of a very Roman-sounding god, Antenachiticus. But also discovered at the temple and now on display at Newcastle's Great North Museum, a carved head of Antenachiticus contains some surprisingly Celtic features. Andrew Parkin is the museum's keeper of archaeology. This statue isn't your typical Roman cult statue, so the way the hair is treated is unusual for a Roman god. Some people have thought that these features might be horns, and we know that the native Britons had horned deities. Other people think that the hair might have been stiffened with lime, and this is again something that we think the native Britons probably did. And the shape of the eyes, these almond-shaped eyes, is not typically Roman either. And finally, there are the remains of a neck ornament, possibly a torque, which is very strongly associated with the population of Britain. So I think this statue is a combination of Roman and local British ideas brought together. But perhaps some of the most compelling evidence that the local Britons enjoyed close links with their Roman neighbours comes not from beneath the ground, but from the air. Aerial photography can reveal hidden features such as buried walls and ditches, which alter the appearance of crops and grasses growing above them. To an expert like David Williscroft, they can generate a startling amount of new information. We recently did a survey of a 10 kilometer radius around a particular Roman fortification. Uh, and within that, area a few decades ago, there would have been seven Iron Age sites known, all of which were hill forts, uh, major big hill forts up in mountain country. 
So we assumed, and the Romans told us that we were looking at a society with endemic warfare, a highly aggressive people that were great resistors to Rome. Um, and the two matched the Roman story and what we saw on the ground seemed to match. As soon as we started to fly, we got huge numbers of perfectly ordinary, isolated, uh, single house farmsteads. In that exact same square now, we have over 400 sites known. Absolutely astonishing numbers. It's that dramatic. Um, and it changes the way we have to look at these societies because isolated farms are very vulnerable. People only risk that sort of settlement pattern, not just when they've got peaceful conditions, but when they've had them so long they take them for granted. They just assume there will be peace. Uh, and that is not the picture at all that either the Romans were trying to sell us uh, or that the hill forts made it look like we had. The story emerging here seems to be far more complex, nuanced and colourful than we once believed. Ancient Britons may have traded with, and certainly mixed with the Romans, who in turn adopted aspects of the indigenous religion, art and culture. It's time for me to leave Hadrian's Wall now and head south towards another of Britain's historical man-made barriers. But on my way, I'm making a slight detour into the heart of Cumbria's Lake District. In search of evidence that the blending of Roman and Britonic cultures worked both ways. At three miles long, Derwent Water is the Lake District's third largest body of water, and even on a grey autumn morning, it's still one of the more spectacular. Close to the southern shore, running parallel to the larger River Derwent, a small stream, or beck, tumbles through ancient woods and cascades a hundred feet over huge boulders. This waterfall is mentioned in an old Cumbrian lullaby called Dinagad Smock, which we think mothers sang to their children as far back as 1400 years ago. <laughs> The words of the song tell of a boy called Dinagad, wrapped in the furs of pine martens, whose father went out with his hunting dogs to catch fish, boar, deer and grouse. The reason that Dinagad's smock is significant is because the Welsh lyrics, which may originally have been composed in the Celtic language of Old Cumbric, could provide a clue that Roman culture also bled into that of the ancient Britons. At the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, Cambridge professor Paul Russell has come to view the earliest known copy of its lyrics in existence. They're contained in a 13th century manuscript written in Old and Middle Welsh rather than Cumbric. And it's a book, not of lullabies, but poems, on the heroic deaths of a Britonic tribespeople who lived in northern England from the late Roman period onwards. This is the Book of Aneirin. And although this is a 13th century manuscript, these poems are thought to have been composed perhaps in the 6th or 7th centuries, but through a process of copying over and over again by scribes, was finally copied into the manuscript we have here. As these copies were made, the language gradually changed into Welsh, and several additional verses were added, including the lullaby of Dinagad Smock. This has a different feel to it in some ways. The range of animals that the hunter is hunting uh, 
includes the local types of animals from the hills and the mountains, but also refers to a lion, and particularly in a simile, talks about hunting like a lion. Now, that suggests something more sophisticated than just a lullaby. And one possibility is that the poet knew about late Roman scenes of hunting, such as we find on the Wint Hill Bowl, where we see animals and hunters chasing each other in a very fast-moving image. This type of image may well have been the inspiration for the type of hunting that this poet had in mind. And given that we are thinking of this happening in Cumbria, in an area of the Lake District, very much a kind of frontier border area that speaks of contact and influence from uh, late Roman literature and late Roman objects, which might want to change our way we think about these kind of areas. So during or shortly after the Roman period in Britain, some ancient Celtic songsmith may have been inspired by surviving Roman artefacts to include lions and other exotic imagery in the lyrics of this gentle lullaby. Paistinoga di vreith vreith, o gruin bala od pan reith, wit wit wid ogaith, gochanun gochenin wiskaith, panele de dadi e helia, la thariasquid, lorianis lau, ev gel we go. Continuing my journey south, I'm on my way to another of Britain's massive fortifications, also built long ago by an incoming people as a physical border with the native inhabitants. If Hadrian's Wall is the most imposing of Britain's ancient fortifications, then the next leg of my journey is taking me to the longest. After the Romans disappeared from these shores, it was the Anglo-Saxons' turn to take up residence here. One of its most powerful kingdoms was Mercia, meaning border people, occupying much of central England. According to one account written a hundred years later, it was the eighth century king of Mercia, Offa, who constructed a huge earthwork along the frontier with the Welsh kingdom of Powys, a distance of around 150 miles. Although not continuous, Offa's Dyke is still the single biggest archaeological monument in Britain. It is a truly remarkable feat of human engineering. Unlike the solid stone structure of Hadrian's Wall in the north, Offa's Dyke is simply an earth bank with a ditch running alongside it. And we can assume that much of its original impressive stature has been lost to erosion over the centuries. It's actually there across that line of trees, although if you don't know what you're looking for, it's surprisingly difficult to see. It just looks like a field boundary now. But like Hadrian's Wall, I'm hoping that it can give me some insight into the people that lived on either side and how our understanding of them has changed. Russell, who happens to be my old college professor, has offered to take me on a guided tour of a section of the Offers Dyke Path. A walkway opened in 1971, which follows much of the original route of the dike. So, Offers Dyke, why would he be building something like that? Well, I think he's probably building it initially when there is conflict with the Welsh. But then there are other periods, even in Offers Reign, when actually he's collaborating with the Welsh. So it's there as a marker, but can then be used in different ways and be part of that kind of zone of contact where any kind of boundary moves to and fro across this sort of zone. So it's more a case of contact between peoples and sometimes that might be conflict, but yeah. there could be all sorts of reasons Indeed, that they're that's meeting. Indeed, that's right. Yes, yeah, so they can be meeting and they can be trading mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people are moving to and fro through this area. Parts of these dikes may well be useful ways of monitoring people, controlling people, mm -hmm. just seeing who's going to and fro and perhaps if they're merchants even taxing them at various points where they can sort of um, have them pass through. But it's also a symbol of power in a way. It's, it's, it's also very much, a symbol of power. Look at my nice big dike. Sort that's of right, thing. exactly like, so. That's right, yep. yes, yes. 
After a little more walking, and quite the build-up, Paul and I finally reached the mighty Offa's Dyke. But as I mentioned, nowadays it can be quite hard to make out. So we're now standing well, on Offa's Dyke? Where is yes. it? Is it down there? Is it up there? Oh, I think the easiest way of thinking of this is really from the far side of the ditch to the far side of the, the upturned earth sort of down there is the whole of that is Offa's Dyke. Just imagine that what we're standing on is formed by the lifting up of soil out of there and piling it up on this, the, as you were, the English side of, of the dike. So I'm up on the English side, you're on the Welsh side? Well, yes, in modern terms, more or less, yes. But the, um, in, in the period when this was being built, um, Offa would have, and his men would have conceived of that being Mercia and that being Powys. And it was Powys particularly that Offa found troublesome at some period. So we have and to stop thinking about it in terms of national identities. Exactly. Where we so might... that, and I think that's crucial for thinking of the whole of this sort of frontier in Wales, is that at different points on that frontier, the local politics can be very different. Clearly, a boundary was felt to be needed and to be marked very clearly on the ground. But there might then be other boundaries, if not marked on the ground, but at least in people's minds. Yes. That were much yes. more localised. Much, much more localised, yes. know, so, so we're over here, we're over there. OK, well, there's another group here that is speaking a different language. Yes. or there yes. these. Yes. So it's, it's much more fluid again. Much it's more much fluid more and potentially very mixed. And that mixture changing over time. Despite the huge efforts and manpower that went into its construction, therefore, historians like Howard Williams now believe that Offa's Dyke was more of a symbolic demonstration of political power. Offa's Dyke was always about controlling a fluid and permeable region. It was never about shutting down contact from one side or the other. It was about management and control, as well as dominating the landscape for the Mercian kings allowing them to raid westwards and control the lands to the west, as well as perhaps also controlling elements of their own kingdom. So can we take a lesson from what we've learned about the actions of our ancestors? I've been quietly reassured by what I've discovered on this journey. At Hadrian's Wall. In the ancient Cumbrian kingdoms and at Offa's Dyke. I think that's one of the things we can take away from Offa's Dyke. We're looking at a grandiose monument. It may have been effective for a time, um, but like the Berlin Wall, like walls elsewhere in these islands, we have to remember that ultimately they, they don't succeed in keeping people apart. No matter how strongly those in power try to enforce division and separation between different cultures, history suggests that ordinary people often have other ideas. A natural tendency to find ways around or through artificial barriers and a desire or even a need to forge links and connections rather than weapons and armour. Human nature, it seems, could be stronger than even the mightiest of boundaries.